Oh, you can join us in person. Okay, fantastic. Hello. Come sit, come sit. I was working with Nancy Singer. With who? Nancy Singer. Oh, Nancy, yeah. She has a lot of great humor, right? Yes. yes. Did we meet last week? Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the World Urban Pavilion. Uh, we are talking about 100 plus Canada's profile in urban SDGs, uh, where we're hearing from uh, Canadians across Canada uh, on their urban innovations and transformations, uh, on how they're improving um, their communities uh, across Canada. Uh, the aim of this session here is, of course, to share the, these, these learnings and these urban innovations to see how we can uh, transfer from community to community, from city to city. Uh, so these uh, individuals that you hear from today, there's five, uh, were selected as some of the most um, innovative approaches uh, to sustainable urban development, uh, how it's connected to the sustainable development goals and such. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Alex Venuto. I'm the Acting Deputy Director of the World Urban Pavilion. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, the World Urban Pavilion is a global knowledge exchange hub for sustainable urbanization and best practices. And it is a collaborative initiative between you and Habitat, Urban Economy Forum, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and the Daniels Corporation as well. Uh, before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Eduardo Moreno, who is the uh, co-director of the World Urban Pavilion, uh, just a couple of, of housekeeping rules here. Um, I have restricted permissions on everybody. Uh, it's probably not that big of a deal here. Um, but you are not able to uh, unmute yourself or, or turn on camera, at least for this point, while the speakers are presenting. Uh, you are welcome to use the chat box. Please share questions and et cetera in the chat box, and I'll make sure to get to them um, as well. Uh, we're gonna do something a little different here uh, today. Uh, following each of the presentations, uh, we will pause for about uh, seven to eight minutes, let's say. Uh, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to perhaps go through one or two questions uh, from the audience, perhaps the speakers have some follow-up remarks on, on their colleagues' presentations. So we will allow uh, that opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into each of the presentations as well. Uh, so that being said, I will turn to my colleague, uh, Eduardo Moreno, uh, Eduardo Lopez Moreno, who's the co-director of the World Urban Pavilion. Uh, and has also uh, been with uh, you and Habitat as the director of the innovation and knowledge uh, department uh, as well uh, for over 26 years. Uh, Eduardo, I, I turn it over to you. Oh, I need to give you permissions, Eduardo. Yes, you need also to, to enable me to, to use the video. Perhaps yes. It does it. It should. It should work now. Okay. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this important session of hundred plus uh, of the World Urban Pavilion. We are a global platform, which our main objective is to inspire action, advocate for urban SDGs and promote innovative actions and best practices as the ones that you are going to present and discuss today. We do that by different means, and I would indicate three that are important for you. We use data. We try to connect data to evidence-based policies, and we want also to define actions and priorities based on this data. The second one, which connects much more to the 100 plus and your work, we identify, we promote, 
we try to systematize best practices and sponsor somehow them at the global level in a way that uh, we can become what we were meant to be to be in terms of our raison d'etre, a global hub, as Alex mentioned in his introduction, a creative and innovative platform, and an agent to advance the sustainability agenda. Uh, let me say one or two words about uh, these three things. The first one, a knowledge exchange. Uh, we would like that uh, uh, your presentations, your work and the, your best practices can help us to push the knowledge frontiers in terms of analysis, in terms of technical solutions, in terms of advisory services, in order to understand what works and why and how it had been working for us to somehow take these ingredients of success and to pass to other cities, to other development partners, to understand how solutions are implemented. We are innovative in, 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 as a platform and trying to promote creativity uh, in urban development in order to your solutions to be used as a strategic alliances, as networking, as capacity building, as technical tools to support urban transformations. And for that, we have created the Canada Front Runner of Urban SDGs. And as part of the Canada Front Runner, the 100 plus initiative that uh, you are presenting today. We would like to promote your pilot projects in different fora, not only in Canada, which of course is extremely important, but also uh, in the UN system and at the world level with our partners. For that purpose, your presentations uh, and the submissions that you made before are identified, systematized, assessed, disseminate, and transform into best practices and innovative solutions made in Canada that we can use in the, in the sustainable development goals to tell cities how creativity, innovation, human agency operate in terms of best practices. We know that cities can offer great opportunities, but also we know, and we work with many cities in the world, that they are affected by recently the pandemic, climate change, economic crisis, inequalities, health problems, et cetera. So these solutions that can be projects, that can be programs, that can be innovative public or private ideas are important for us. We don't want to work in only in one area. We are interested in knowledge, in urban transformation, in a specific sectoral things like affordable housing, infrastructure development, technology-driven solutions, et cetera. I conclude uh, colleagues by saying that what we are interested is in your creative capital and the possibility to use this capital to unleash the use of local resources and assets to maximize opportunities when possible to have impact to reduce inequalities, improve uh, the environment and redefine comparative advantages of societies. And of course, at the end of all this, to increase well-being of inhabitants. The World Urban Pavilion want to use the 100 plus to advance creativity, innovation, and to understand that if governments promote this, they are not the only one and we have society and actors in society that can use the powers of imagination and their creative capital and transformation to co-create with us the solution. At the end, the pavilion encourage, establish, institutionalize, and to some extent legitimize the solutions that are all wrapped at 100 plus initiatives, recognizing local transformations. Thank you for your efforts. And to tell you that uh, this is not only one presentation, it's the beginning of uh, many actions associated to this, a report that will come and presentations in other fora, in other scenarios. We count on you on this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eduardo, uh, for uh, diving a little bit deeper into how the 100 plus aligns with the pavilion's mandate uh, and also our, our how, we, how we plan on moving forward 
uh, with our partners here today and also uh, hopefully many new partners in the future as we continue to advocate uh, for this work and Canada as a front runner of the urban SDGs. That being said, I will move to our first speaker, uh, which is Claire Le Pen, who's the Vice President of Calgary Municipal Land Corporation. Claire will speak on East Village uh, Master Plan. Claire, I turn it over to you. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of uh, background about yourself uh, and then also, of course, the, the initiative that you've submitted, please. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me um, and hello to everybody on the call. Uh, so as Alex mentioned, I work with the Calgary Municipal Land Corporation, um, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the city of Calgary. Um, and we were formed uh, really with a very uh, specific mandate in 2007, and it was to look at the revitalization of an area of our downtown on the eastern edge called the Rivers District. Um, and for the past 15 years, we focused in a portion of that district uh, on a community called East Village, which was actually um, where the city first started, but had had fallen into um, disrepair and a number of infrastructure and social challenges existed within the community at the time that we started. And so since that time, um, we're a small team. Um, we're as big as we've actually ever been right now. Um, we're a team of 34. Um, when I started 12 years ago, there were six of us. And so it's been um, a progression as the community development progressed and our involvement with different aspects of the community has increased over the course of those last number of years to really look at how we foster the revitalization of this area and all the different elements of the community that have gone into creating what it is today. And so I have a presentation that I, um, Alex, I can just share my screen from here, I think. Yes, um, you should have access, Claire. Let me know if there's an issue. Uh, let me just get this up. So my presentation provides an overview of the master plan, the work that we've done in this community um, since we were formed in 2007. Um, and it's really, can you see it there? Let's... Yes, Claire. Okay, thank you. Um, so it gives you an overview, um, and I'll speak to the different elements that have gone into informing our work. Um, so as I mentioned, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the city of Calgary. Uh, at the time that we were formed in 2007, East Village was an area uh, of our downtown that was really, um, had a number of challenges related to it. And primarily it was, had so many barriers to incentivizing any sort of private development, um, that there was very little development attraction to the neighborhood in the last 20 years prior to our time of being involved. There was some previous urban plans that were done that um, more or less had false starts to them and really didn't get off the ground. And so it was the structure of CMLC as a special entity that could lead the revitalization effort at an arm's length from the city. We operate independently. We report to the city twice a year. We have our own board of directors of which the mayor sits on. Um, but it's been an effort to look at how we revitalize this whole area. And if you fast forward to 2023, we're now leading over a billion dollars of city building projects in this area, both in East Village, which is in the northern half, and, and Victoria Park, which is in the southern half, which I'll speak to on the next slide. Um, my, myself, um, I oversee all of our communication and strategic partnerships for the organization. Um, we're a company that's divided into three divisions. We have our building and infrastructure division, our communications and partnership division, of which programming and marketing sit within as well. Our finance and corporate services um, are sort of make up the complement of our team. To give you a bit of geographic perspective, um, an overview of downtown, if you can see my cursor, this is primarily our, our downtown core. Um, Calgary is a very suburban city. Our population in our downtown is not particularly large in comparison to the other big cities in Canada, like Vancouver and Toronto. Um, but the East Village area that we're talking about here today is in the yellow box up at the top. Um, it's 49 acres. It's bordered by two rivers that bisect our downtown, the Bow River and the Elbow River. And it's on the edge of a 49, uh, sorry, a 50 acre um, federal heritage site called Fort Calgary, which is the birthplace of Calgary. And for many years prior to that, many, many years prior to that, it was the first indigenous settlements at the confluence of our, our river. Um, so it's a culturally significant site. Um, there was just so many challenges in the development, which I'll speak to that really precluded much happening in this area for the number of years leading up to our existence. 
Um, the red boundary, just for perspective, which I'll speak to on the next slide, relates to our funding mechanism. So we have a funding mechanism that enables us to do the type of development in this area that was required. Um, and in 2018, we started looking at the southern half of the district, which is everything within the white boundary, um, all of which sits within our total jurisdiction, but looking at how we could bring the same type of redevelopment and revitalization and urban planning considerations into the southern half of the district as well. Um, I mentioned our funding mechanism, which is um, at the time in 2007, it was the first time it had been used in Canada. It's since in other jurisdictions in the country, but um, we refer to it as a community revitalization levy. It most for, it's most similar to tax increment financing in the United States. Um, how it functions is that we had a term uh, which was originally set from 2007 to 2027. Um, a few years ago, it was extended to 2047 when we took on the southern half of the district. Um, what it was was the municipal government and the provincial government agreed to cap the municipal and provincial property taxes at the 2007 level and any growth within this district after 2007 um, as we increase the property base with future development would go to fund that development. So we borrow against future um, future property taxes that we project in the community based on the progression of development in the community. And that's enabled us to fund the infrastructure improvements that have taken place in the community since 2000, uh, when we released the master plan in 2009. Um, to give you some perspective of East Village, um, East Village sits right on the edge of our downtown core. As I mentioned, it's flanked by two rivers. Um, it's got great proximity to a number of our inner city communities as well. So on paper, um, the development site itself was quite attractive. Where some of the challenges were, we're looking at it had aging infrastructure challenges. It had flood mitigation requirements that often were what um, were barriers to private development coming in. Um, we had a lot of challenges with the urban grid. Um, many of the streets in downtown Calgary are one way. Um, most of the streets in East Village when we started were sort of one way out. Um, we didn't have a lot of infrastructure connections around the community to facilitate an increase to the residential and commercial development targets that we were suggesting for the area. So when we did the master plan in 2000 and released it in 2009, we projected um, another 3,500 condominium and apartment homes being built in this community, 11,000 residents, which at the time was just under 2,000, um, and a significant amount of square footage development on the commercial and retail side. So I'll give you a bit of perspective of how that's progressed since that time. Um, our role, oops, jumped ahead there. Um, our role has been looking at how we not only manage the infrastructure connections into the community, but also how we look at the activation of the community in such a way that we're contributing to the social environment and the social fabric of the community by supporting different community events, festivals, organizations coming into the community to really build a sense of community. There was a lot of safety challenges in East Village when we started. Um, and a lot of that work has continued to look at how we continue to balance and foster a healthy community. Um, to give you a little bit of perspective, um, this sort of whole area here is comprised uh, of the East Village community. You can see when we started, um, a lot of the development was very fragmented. We did have some existing residential in the community that was primarily um, seniors residential and subsidized housing, which is still there and integrated as part of the community today, but very little by way of development density um, in any other part of the community. Um, we were physically cut off by, this is the CP rail track on our north side or south side, sorry, that really prevented a lot of the north south traffic flow through the community. Um, we were, this is our municipal city hall building right here, which when it was built in the 80s, really kind of turned its back on East Village that you know really made it challenging to bring people from the downtown core physically across into this part of the downtown, um, as well as some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, infrastructure challenges in the community and flood proofing requirements that were needed to be in place to support the development moving forward. 
Um, when this picture was taken, one of our first initiatives in the community was a stormwater retention pond that would help facilitate some of the requirement in the community as development progressed. And you can see that it was starting to take shape in terms of the streetscapes and utility upgrades that were underway along the river at that time. If you fast forward um, to last year, all of the outline boxes give you a perspective on all of the investment and development that has occurred in the community since that time. And I'll speak to <clears throat> in a bit more detail, the different residential mixed use community projects that were brought in through private developers, as well as this public space and renewal efforts in the community that have helped create a more attractive community and subsequently um, helped grow our residential population since that time as well. We're sitting today at about 4,000, uh, maybe 4,500 4, residents in the community by comparison to where we were at in 2009. Um, a lot of the work in the community was, uh, for the first number of years, was infrastructure related. Um, we were able to partner with our local energy provider, NMAX, and bring district energy um, into the community. They had a district energy plant that was just on the south end of the community that enabled us to attach a number of the buildings in the community into a district energy provider service. Um, this picture here shows both part of, excuse me, those utility upgrades taking place as well as the streetscapes. Um, so you start to get a bit of perspective on how the community has evolved over the course of the last number of years. If you're familiar with Calgary, this is our central library that CMLC um, completed the build up in 2018. Um, and this was part of the answer to how we sort of reconnect the urban grid of the community. Um, this was, uh, if I just go back a slide, this was our city hall building, which ended with a parking lot down here. And when we did the design competition, excuse me, I just have to cough for a minute. Oh, since I have a dry throat. Um, when we did the design competition, we were looking at opportunities for how we could bring a development and activate that site in such a way that it would bring people across and through and into East Village. The library ended up being that solution. Um, and you can kind of see the path through here that connects people directly from East Village through the library um, and onto the rest of our downtown. <laughs> um, this is a, a bit of a challenging image to read, but just to give you a perspective, when we started with the community, we were responsible and had ownership uh, at the time that was transferred to us by the city of about 75% of the land that was formerly held by the city of Calgary. Um, it's enabled us to look at the development sequencing and phasing, as well as the selection of partners that we are looking at working with to activate and bring residential mixed use projects into the community. Um, all of the white parcels are ones that have been built since that time. <clears throat> all of the red are ones that are sold or committed and are um, in the pipeline for future development as, uh, as the community progresses. Um, and I'll speak to you here, I'll run through a few different slides just to give you a perspective of the range of projects that have taken place in the community um, since we started. They vary from public space development, infrastructure, um, heritage restoration, Calgary doesn't have a particularly large heritage inventory, but we had four of them <clears throat> significant assets in this community when we started, um, as well as our programming and vitality efforts in the community to continue to foster its growth as development phasing progressed and continues to progress in the years ahead. Um, so I talked a little bit about the connection to the river. Calgary, um, <clears throat> the river was quite cut off from uh, East Village. And so you could actually, when you were standing at the edge of the river, barely access it. And so part of our first uh, projects and renewal initiatives was to look at how we reconnect the river in a, in a way that allows people to um, enjoy it, access the river. It also was part of our flood mitigation efforts, the new river pathway that extends two kilometers through and around the edge of East Village is raised to the one in 100 year floodplain level and following the 2013 flood in Calgary and changes to provincial regulations, we have some portions of it that were just last year raised to the one in 200 year floodplain level. <clears throat> and so this was actually one of our first infrastructure pieces that went prior to any of these developments here in the background being built um, as an opportunity to 
demonstrate the community that we were intending to become. And that investment that was enabled through our funding mechanism allowed us to put some of these infrastructure investments in prior to some of these developments um, being underway. Um, another component to the community is um, was the renewal and revitalization of what is called St. Patrick's Island. It's a 30 acre island that, as you can see, sits immediately off the shore of the Bow River adjacent to East Village. Um, similarly, it was an area that had very little, um, very little activity. It was the most underutilized park space that we had in all of our city inventory. It was disconnected from our regional pathway system. So we were looking at opportunities to facilitate connections, um, amenity base for the community and looking at the renewal of this environmental space to really look at how it could be established um, in a more productive way moving forward. The bridge that you see in the background was part of that effort as well as the revitalized, revitalization of this space into a more naturalized area was part of that work. Um, we have worked through a number of different uh, temporary activations as development in the community progresses. Um, we've looked at activating particular sites such as this one, which is with a temporary basketball court to really just help facilitate more vibrancy and urban activity in the community as the community progresses. As I mentioned, um, there was a number of heritage buildings in the community of which CMLC invested in the restoration of those and then su subsequent selection of tenant groups that could come in and activate those spaces that we still are in partnership with a number of those different groups and have ownership of those to help curate the type of retail and activation within the community. This is one of those that sits on the edge of the Bow River. I spoke to the library already. It gives you a bit of perspective of how we try to address um, part of the challenge with the site and the barrier of our city hall was also the uh, our city's LRT train line running through the middle and bisecting that site. So part of the library's design was encapsulating that LRT tunnel in such a way that the library was able to build up and over it and help activate that site in a more interesting way. Um, we While this wasn't a CMLC project, this is part of the heritage restoration effort with the building in the lower left corner there. Um, the building itself is our the National Music Hall of Fame for Canada. Um, it's known as Studio Bell, which is a partnership with Bell Media. Um, and it's a, it includes a number of facilities like performance hall, recording studios, um, museum space, curated educational space, and a number of different initiatives as well. Um, I spoke about a little bit about the urban connections. This is part of that. Um, some of those connections on our edges to facilitate better opportunity for increased development and density in the community moving forward. The Ninth Ave Bridge was one of those. Um, and then just a, a couple more as it relates to the progression of the community, <clears throat> which has really evolved in the last number of years as the community builds out was um, CMLC in the way that we're structured, we are also responsible for the delivery and management of our public space assets as well as their maintenance um, and activation. So we have a team of individuals who help support the activation of events and programming in the community year round, as well as different initiatives <laughs> that are brought in seasonally, like you can see at the top with our um, East Village Nordic Loop, which was brought in as a pandemic initiative and has continued in the winter since. Um, I, included, I included a slide just on safety and vitality. It's certainly um, a prevalent consideration that we look at as the community progresses and continues to be a challenge in our downtown core. And we see it in this community as well. And looking at how we partner with different outreach services. So community providers in addressing some of those, excuse me. Um, I'll just finish quickly just with a, I'll touch quickly on um, the southern half the district, um, which is where we're spending quite a bit of our effort um, for orientation. It's all of this area down here. It's about 286 acres compared to the 49 acres of East Village. Um, it's where the Calgary Stampede takes place. If you're familiar with that, it starts this evening, actually, um, the 10-day festival. So a lot of this is predominantly festival space, but we are looking at how we could bring the same revitalization effort into this community, and we partner with Stampede 
on a number of initiatives that are underway. Right now, um, it's considered to be part of our emerging culture and entertainment district in the city. And we're working through um, a few different city building capital projects to help really amplify the activity and tourism and economic impact of this part of the community. <clears throat> One of those is the expansion of our convention facility. This is a rendering of it here um, and it gives you a perspective. This is it today. It's a over 500,000 square foot addition to our existing facility that will open next year. <clears throat> we also have the 17th Ave train station. When we talk about connections, it was looking at how we create an, and improve the pedestrian public realm through a redesign of the LRT station to put it at grade and bring people across and into the community in a way that they typically haven't been able to. This was all uh, sort of a plus 15 network to get into Stampede Park. Cars couldn't drive into Stampede Park. We're reconnecting that whole urban connection through these projects. Um, there's a considerable amount of streetscapes improvements going into this area as an opportunity to put in multi-modes of activation, such as cycling tracks, um, more pedestrian realm and public space activation to attract private development on the edges of these streets where there currently isn't any um, private development and continuing to foster opportunities for an increase in the residential base here as well. This part of the district has about 4 million square feet of uh, space in the development pipeline over the course of the next 20 years. And then I'll just add on two facilities components that sit within our Western boundary and adjacency to downtown that are part of the complement to East Village is we are working through a redesign of our arts facility, arts commons in our downtown, as well as Olympic Plaza, which is a large, probably our largest civic gathering place in the downtown to look at how we can develop that in such a way that it um, provides more opportunity and activation in our downtown core and helps support the city's initiatives and ambitions to really animate and activate and attract investment into our downtown core as well. So that is an overview of um, all of our work related to East Village and the component parts that went into our submission for this with World Pavilion. I apologize for my coughing in the middle of that and <laughs> dry throat, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Claire. That was a very informative presentation and we at the Pavilion are for sure interested um, in uh, East Village and, and also the future work uh, of the Calgary Municipal Land Corporation. Uh, we're excited to see some of the other activities that you're, you're also working for. And of course, we welcome you to leverage the Pavilion, um, you know, to enrich your work uh, through our international expertise and, and also through the United Nations system as well. Uh, Perhaps uh, before I get to Dini's question there, Claire, we'll go through two. I, I just had one question. I wanted to come back, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to the community revitalization levy and perhaps just a, a couple of questions on that. Um, so us at the Pavilion, we're, we're very interested in terms of how, uh, what are some uh, innovative financing models for community development, for urban development. Um, and I understand that this was a, a, a new uh, funding model that was introduced by the Calgary Municipal Land Corporation. I, I have two questions to this. Uh, one is, it, it sounds as though it's almost a land value capture mechanism. Um, and I'm curious on how you determine the future property taxes. Was this simply just kind of based off of, you know, the, the city of Calgary's property tax inflation? Or was it also based off of other components about the you know, transit oriented community, the culture and the environmental components as well, which would obviously increase the property taxes quite a bit. And then the second one that I'm, I'm also curious about is if the community revitalization levy was integrated further into perhaps the city of Calgary's uh, urban development that the um, Calgary Municipal Land Corporation may not be involved in. I'm curious about how this kind of, uh, fed into other initiatives uh, in the future. Um, yeah. Alex, Alex, just one thing. If, if you could add to the question, uh, I was going to ask something similar on the how you manage from legal or financial point of view to segregate the property tax revenue in order to keep it locally. Yeah. I would be quite interested also. Yeah, that is the 
that's the sort of key element that makes it work. So the decision was made between our municipal government and our provincial government um, to look at a funding mechanism that would uh, enable the type of development that was going to be required or the infrastructure costs, at least primarily when we started to be able to attract invest investment into this area. And so that was agreement um, that was arrived at between those two late levels of government that they both had to agree that any increase in property tax from that 2007 level would be redirected into this fund and allow us to borrow against those future revenues to fund this development. And so as, and so it's not actually, um, there's no increase to the property tax of all of the taxpayers within this district. It's just that where it was capped at that 2007 level, any increase past that point is redirected. So they're not, it's not an extra levy tax that's put on anyone within this district. It's just a redirection and the city and the, and the province had to agree to stand down from that increase over the term of the CRL. Um, and so at a time when the term ends, that increased property taxes that are collected within this district will then start flowing back through the city and the province again, So, in which is 2047 for us. So there's a sort of end goal for them as well about an increased property tax base that they're currently not um, realizing um, because it's being redirected into the fund that will benefit them at the end of the term as well. Um, that is um, the mechanics of that were through that agreement when we were formed. Um, and then the it was actually the agreement to have the revitalization levy in place was the first step, the formation of us as a wholly owned subsidiary to oversee that and to lead the development was the second step. And so there was an intention to keep it at an arm's length. So we don't operate within the um, confines of the specific business units within the city administration. Um, we interface with them. The city's our single shareholder. We report to them twice a year. We have bylaws in place that manage our borrowing bylaws and some of the more detailed considerations of how the fund is managed. Um, but the other part of the question, Alex, was on the forecasting of that. So um, we do a forecast uh, annually and the factors that look into that are development that's occurring or projected to occur within the community um, from a retail and uh, sorry, from a residential and commercial standpoint. Um, we work with all of the different um, uh, developer partners in the community so that we have timeline targets in terms of the timelines for their projects so that we can uh, accurately forecast uh, what that CRL projection will look like and how we can borrow against based on those projections. <clears throat> we do it at a very conservative level. Um, the CRL has been in place in 2008, downturn in 2014 through the pandemic. In the pandemic, we were forecasting the CRL twice a year to ensure that the impacts of the pandemic weren't threatening the commitments that we've made on projects through the CRL. So it's an ongoing process that we monitor to ensure that we aren't overcommitted um, in terms of what the fund will ultimately be able to pay back as the property tax base increases in the community. So to give you perspective, um, part of the CRL also includes some of our downtown um, office towers, which have a, you know, a not, uh, they have a significant property tax base um, and property tax generation coming out of those. So um, that helps service sort of the jurisdiction of where the CRL is pulled from. Um, and since 2009, there's been almost 1,800 new uh, apartment and condominiums, home, apartment and condominium homes built, as well as a number of other commercial developments, all of which go towards the increase in CRL capture um, that is redirected to CMLC through this mechanism. Thanks, Claire. I, I do want to move on to the next presentation. There are two questions in here. Claire, perhaps if I can have you in, in one minute um, answer Dini's question. Have residents have uh, has resident, residents and businesses been granted a legal right to return? And also Patrick's question, does CMLC have a mandate to address affordable housing? One minute, Claire, uh, if possible. Yeah, so on the affordable housing, um, we don't, we 
we are not mandated because we are not the group that's building the residential homes. Um, there are targets that the city sets around affordable housing targets for new developments in urban redevelopment areas of which are managed by the city. Um, we were in a position and actually still are where we have among the highest concentration of affordable and subsidized housing in the community by comparison of other inner city communities. So to date, the projects that residential that have been built in East Village have primarily been market. Um, that uh, balances that uh, that is starting to balance out a little bit as the market condominiums are, and apartments are built against some of the affordable and subsidized housing projects that were already here when we started. Um, so that will be a piece that we monitor moving forward to continue to maintain that balance within the community at a level that is um, appropriate. We also have uh, a, a couple of the city's uh, vulnerable population homeless shelters that exist within the community as well. And Alex, sorry, I, I'm not sure what the first question was of for a citizen right or something. Yes, the first question was from Dini, just so everyone knows, Dini is a member of the Region Park community, uh, very valuable to the, the pavilion as we connect with community members, um, knowing a little bit about the history of Region Park. Her question was, have residents and businesses been granted a legal right to return if, if that is something that factors into the development? No, it didn't factor in because there was such a low residential base when we started um, that all of those residents have been maintained and been in the community throughout the duration of the development. Um, and as the community continues to progress and the residential population increases, um, they've continued in the community throughout that time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. I move to the next presentation. Uh, next, we have Oren Singer from Sparrow Living. Uh, he is the co-founder and CEO of Sparrow Living. Oren, the floor is yours. Awesome. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, can you see my video? I we can it's okay. We can get started. So all right, thank yeah, thanks, Alex. Um so my name is Oren Singer, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sparrow Living. Sparrow is a home sharing platform that matches together those who have extra space, and that extra space can be in the form of a spare bedroom or a secondary suite. And we match them to people who are seeking accommodation for minimum two months, which to us represents um, definitely not a short-term rental, but more of a permanent uh, place where somebody can, can live. Uh, we're proudly supported by the CMHC and Accenture, uh, both of whom have been instrumental in establishing uh, and developing Sparrow um, and really getting it off the ground. We officially launched Sparrow into Canada in early 2022. Uh, in terms of where we're operating, it's mainly in the greater Toronto area, uh, as well as the lower mainlands of British Columbia. Uh, so starting with the problem, you know, the challenges faced by both renters as well as homeowners in today's housing market, I think we can all agree are unprecedented. You know, for renters on the left-hand side, you can see the average rent in Canada has reached a staggering, well, it's over $2,000 a month, uh, making it increasingly more difficult for individuals to find housing. Um, in fact, over 90, in over 90% of Canadian cities, uh, if you're making or earning a minimum wage, you can't afford an average price a unit in that in that region. Um, you know, let that sink in, knowing that incomes are not going up at this stage and our population is growing. We just surpassed 40 million. Uh, on the homeowner side, homeowners too are grappling with their own set of problems. One in five believe they can no longer afford their homes. Uh, and it's concerning knowing that one in four say they all have to, they'll be forced to sell if interest rates continue to climb higher. Um, so these, these statistics underscore the urgent need for new and innovative solutions that can help to bridge the gap between affordability and accessibility in housing. And it's really the backdrop that, that which Sparrow uh, endeavors to have a meaningful and create a meaningful change. Um, you know, this is interesting. If we look at what's coming ahead in Canada, um, you know, as a result of interest rate hikes uh, to date, you know, since February, only one in, sorry, only one in three um, 
only one in three mortgage holders have had their mortgage payments increase. And so the real effect uh, in terms of the financial effect that Canada is going to experience is coming from what's ahead over the next three years, where we expect all mortgages to see an increase in payments by the end of 2026. And so what does this mean? If cost of living continues to rise, um, cost of housing continues to rise, incomes don't rise or keep pace fast enough, many homeowners are going to be looking for alternative ways of supplementing income. The elephant in the room is really that there lies a vast untapped potential uh, waiting to be harnessed in the form of 12 million spare empty bedrooms across Canada with 5 million alone in Ontario. These unused spaces represent a tremendous opportunity to address the housing crisis by unlocking hidden capacity of supply. And we believe that home sharing uh, is a solution that can is act as a win-win for both renters and homeowners across Canada. Uh, we can create living arrangements that not only help alleviate the financial burdens faced by renters and homeowners, but also foster stronger and more resilient communities in the process. And our platform is designed to bridge the gap between those who have spare rooms or extra space and those who are searching for a, a place to live by matching homeowners and tenants based on their needs, their preferences, their lifestyles, uh, to create living situations that benefits all parties involved. And so how do we do this? We are making it safer, easier, and more enjoyable to, sh to share space. Uh, this includes robust safety measures, including ID verification, background checks, uh, insurance coverage, as well as providing homeowners and renters with, with peace of mind. Uh, we're working towards making it easier by facilitating communication between users, enabling them to chat, schedule room viewings, create home share agreements, and automate rental payments through the platform. Uh, and to further enhance our member experience, we use a unique compatibility matching system that brings together individuals with shared interests, values, and lifestyles. Um, this approach, along with our, our dedicated team, uh, helps all parties lead to a shared living experience that's enjoyable and ultimately helps us achieve our vision, which is a world where people live better together. So through data-driven matching, we're able to achieve this. We're seeing over the past year and a half, a flywheel effect take form, where starting at the top, stronger matching is leading to better shared living experiences which is leading to more homeowners garnering interest in shared living, uh, leading to more options and choice for renters to, to see on our platform, uh, which ultimately together leads to stronger data sets that can strengthen our matching accuracy. And I think the, the most powerful way to really show you the impact of Sparrow is through stories. And so we're capturing the stories of our members which I think will really help to visualize. Um, we have a series of, of stories below here. I don't, I don't think we have time for all of these, Alex, um, but maybe I can share one. Um, I think last time I spoke, I shared the story of Karen and Kareen. So this time, um, maybe I'll, I'll share this one of Tammy. Um, I just don't know if volume will, will share. You can give me maybe a thumbs up, Alex, if it's... Uh, if it's going, just give me a second while I pull this in. My name's Tamas Ashby. My husband died six years ago. So it gets, you know, a little difficult being lonely, you know, and the extra income actually helps too. But, you know, it's nice to have another person there. I had Gabriella get in touch with me. And, you know, she sounded great. She's from Peru and she's studying graphic design. And the school that she was going to actually isn't too far from where I am. And, you know, you can get there on the bus. 
you know, she's very nice. She's, she's quiet. You know, she comes and goes. There's no, like, you know, I have no rules. Just, you know, clean up after yourself. Don't leave messes. It's gone really, really well. The one thing that I have difficulty with, I need someone to clean my bathtub because I can't get down to clean the bathtub. It's the one thing I can't do in the apartment. When you're an older person like myself, it's nice to have someone else there. Well, I think it not only benefits the, the, the host, but also benefits, uh, benefits the person that's moving in too. You have a nice home. You basically have everything set up when you move in it's been very positive you know it helps you mentally because you know you can get lonely being alone after my husband died I was alone for a long time and I was sort of like even going out with friends and doing stuff you're you're coming back you walk in you don't say hello nothing and it's sort of like it's nice to have someone there you know that you talk to because that's a big thing like it's hard when you get older and you're alone all the time. It's nice to have that additional extra income because it helps you not only help you pay your rent, but you know, different bills that you have. And it's nice to, you know, know that, okay, you know, I have this much extra money a month that is disposable to me. Oh yeah. I would recommend it to a lot of people. I mean, if you have a bedroom that's not being used these students need it seriously these people that are coming here to Canada to go to school a lot of times you can't stay on campus those places are all taken up there's no place to stay as far as trying to rent an apartment by yourself you know you you can't do that it's just too much money and it's like there are so many people that have the space and it's like if you've got the space do it Yeah, so just just one of the powerful stories from from our hosts, um, you know, to date in our in our first year in market, which was 2022, uh, we did 110 matches. Uh, this year, we're on pace to surpass 500. Um, and there's plenty of stories like these where we're helping both homeowners and renters uh, create. Uh, amazing shared living experiences and and that's what it's all about so talking about impact uh, we've made significant strides in creating tangible social impact directly contributing to the un's sdgs by promoting affordable and sustainable housing solutions here uh, so as i mentioned through our platform we helped in, in 2022 numbers uh, we helped 110 um, we helped match 110 vacant units and so that translated into 180,000 saved in rent for renters relative to average market rates, uh, earned just over 280,000 in income for homeowners. And, and keep in mind, these homeowners um, are more cash strapped. They're either struggling to afford their, their mortgage or struggling to keep up with cost of living. Um, and then, we're proud that 90% of the matches that we've created involve a vulnerable population that could include a senior, uh, it could include a student uh, or newcomers to Canada, which are our large segments that we cater to. Um, just moving along here, in terms of where do we go from here, right? We've, we've done the, it's been a, a incredible journey for me personally and, and the team to get to where we're at at this stage. Um, but the work has just begun, right? And at this stage, we have the foundation of our platform. We have early successes and stories, uh, and we see the market where it's heading uh, in need of a solution like Sparrow. And so we're really excited to solve this pressing societal need. Our mission is to unlock over 10,000 rooms by 2026. Uh, and creates over 10,000 positive shared living experiences in the process. Uh, this year, we're currently on pace to forex our impact from our first year in market. And so, you know, with the right support, the right backing, the right partners at the table, 
uh, we're confident that we can continue to scale up and create a meaningful difference for, for Canada here. Um, so thanks. And I'll uh, open the floor now to any questions, if there are any. Thank you so much, Oren. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. And I had written some questions down here and, and you answered a couple of them. Um, I still have some, some as well, but uh, just one thing I wanna say is if, if I uh, am recalling my facts correctly, I, I believe Canada, we're building 250,000 uh, new households a year. Uh, and you can see here from your number, 10K uh, additional room supplied uh, by December, 2026. I mean, it's very clear the benefit that Sparrow Living has uh, when we're in the midst of a housing crisis here as well. Um, I, I appreciate your, your comment on the vulnerable populations. Uh, that was definitely one of my uh, questions. Um, one of my other ones though, was just diving a little bit more into perhaps, you know, what were some of the challenges that, that you had to navigate? I'm, I'm wondering in terms of uh, buy-in from the housing owners, uh, if that was a challenge. And then the other one would be, uh, I know you have funding from CMHC, as well, but I'm wondering if there is uh, issues around, you know, municipal roadblocks such as bylaws uh, preventing Sparrow Living from, um, you know, getting into that city. Yeah, great, great questions. I'll start with the first one around um, friction points or barriers uh, to have homeowners open up their their mind to this, and definitely right sharing sharing your home with a stranger um, is is no easy feat. I, I think where we're heading right now is a combination of uh, wanting to do this, but also there's a large portion of people who are just in need to do this, um, just given the economic climate we're in right now. And so how we address that is through our comprehensive screening process. So that includes at, the, at a minimum an, an identity check, right? Just to have a conversation with somebody and potentially be introduced. And then we take it the next level to do a full background check, which includes a criminal record check, uh, drafting and putting together the unique type of um, boarding or legal agreement that governs the relationship between these two parties, which um, a lot of people are, are, they need to have that in place to feel comfortable. Um, so the screening process included, included with our matching process that takes into account homeowners' habits, lifestyle, and preferences, um, that seems to address their, their uh, concerns. Uh, but naturally, there's going to be a, um, a, a majority cohort, it's a cohort of uh, homeowners who may not be comfortable doing this, need more awareness around it, and need to see others and the positive effects it can have on others to feel comfortable with that. And um, that's really what we're working on here is how do we, how do we normalize home sharing? How do we uh, bring awareness and drive more awareness to it across Canada? Um, so I hope that answered your first question. The, the next question I heard was around any, um, any uh, barriers at the municipality level as it relates to bylaws. Uh, so each municipality is, is different. Um, so we're not in every single municipality across Canada yet, and we'll have to look at any of the regulations that might be, um, might be uh, present there. Uh, typically, what we do find is that if you're able, you are able to rent out a room or up to two rooms uh, in the home. As you get greater than that number, that can conflict with some bylaws in the municipality because they may be concerned it's turning into more of a rooming house, in which case you would need certain licenses and privileges to do that. Um, but it, it's on a case by case basis. Um, you know, I, th I think it's also interesting for us to maybe uh, work with municipalities on this as we grow, right? Because if the space is there um, and we're, you know, uh, doing it in a safe, um, in a safe way, um, it's a great form of housing supply that can go to serve many Canadians who are looking and desperately need housing. Um, so we'll we'll keep close attention on that as we grow. Awesome, thank you, Oren. Very clear. Uh, I have one more question from Patrick. What type of operational partners, like university senior groups, etc., do you currently have? Great question, Patrick. Yeah, so on the university side, we are working with um, UBC right now as uh, one option for off-campus housing that they display to their students. We're, we're looking to further grow and, and develop partnerships on the university side. Uh, and then in terms of seniors groups, we are partnered up with CARP um, 
which has, uh, I believe, over 300,000 members across Canada. Um, and last year we did a, a little bit more with them. We're looking to also uh, start to market to that audience as well, because there's tons of tons of seniors and retirees, uh, particularly who could benefit from the extra income or uh, living with somebody compatible in the home. Awesome, thank you, Oren. Very clear how your initiative is not only impacting increasing supply, but also those social benefits um, and cultural benefits as well from, from this work. Uh, I will move on to our next speaker, uh, Alina Turner, CEO and co-founder of Helpseeker Technologies, uh, and also from School of Cities, University of Toronto. Uh, Alina has been working on the Compass Project, uh, transforming the social safety nets. Alina, please, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not from the University of Toronto, Marcus, but he's up next. So uh, we did do this um, project in partnership with U of T, however, and I think that um, we did submit it as a as something that we collaborated on together. So uh, thanks for having me, everybody, and lovely to be here. I'll just start sharing my screen and tell you a little bit about what we've been up to. So uh, I too, I'm joining you from uh, Mokinsis, uh, Calgary Treaty 7. And uh, uh, having said that, I haven't been to East Village lately, so it was exciting to see all the, all the uh, cool work that's happening there uh, from our uh, colleagues here at the City of Calgary. So a little bit about um, Help Seeker as well. Um, we are a social enterprise that focuses on, on technology and bringing uh, data to uh, decision makers that are working on complex social challenges at a pretty unprecedented time. Um, we tend to focus on these convoluted, complex, multifactorial challenges, things like addictions and mental health, homelessness and housing instability, community and personal safety. And the whole premise is can we develop new technologies, bring new data, uh, new thinking, new systems approaches to solving some of these challenges? And it's not us solving the challenges, so we're supporting the decision makers um, and folks on the ground that are, are doing so. Tend to work with municipalities most of the time. They, they're municipalities that are tackling some of these challenges that they don't necessarily have full control over because of the jurisdictional issues that we're all very familiar with, with you know, some of these uh, health uh, spending coming from the province or uh, some of the decisions being made federally uh, in Canada, uh, yet the municipalities where all of these issues coalesce. And so um, it was just perfect um, opportunity to talk about that in terms of of the future of cities for us in, in today's session as well. So um, the challenge for the folks that we support with our technology is that they're uh, making decisions about social challenges and uh, they need the data to do so and they know that good data equals good decisions. Um, however, most of the time in social planning, um, and I'm not putting everyone in the same in this category, but a lot of the time they're not data scientists, especially in the smaller municipalities that have, you know, somebody working off the side of their desks, trying to um, develop a homelessness strategy or a mental health and addiction strategy, yet they're also managing the recreation department and, uh, um, you know, planning for new parks and, and all of uh, these other related challenges, uh, protective services, et cetera. So they're not necessarily these uh, data nerds like some of us. Um, and when they do uh, have some of these data skills, the data sometimes is, is just not there. It's fragmented, it's bad, it's, it's non-existent. Uh, and what we've also found is that even if they do have the data that's perfect, they don't necessarily know what the data means in terms of strategic decision-making either when it comes to these social policy challenges as well. So lots of lots of challenges. Um, the other piece I wanted to mention, though, is that the data that we do have is oftentimes not working for us. Um, so a couple of, of insights here, public sector um, and the fragmented nature of data growth, uh, data issues, the fact that majority of the data is unstructured, um, majority of the social sector itself, uh, so folks that are actually delivering social services on the ground, are 
SMEs or small medium enterprises. They uh, charities in particular uh, tend to um, tend to be the ones that are implementing some of these initiatives on the ground that are funded by municipalities or work in partnership with municipalities. And there, the fragmentation is is even worse as well. So um, that's been the, the premise of this, the Compass project that we took on in partnership with University of Toronto that I'll tell you more about is, you know, how can we solve this data problem? How do we find the right data, create the data where it doesn't exist, and then take it through that pipeline from data to uh, decision to outcome to ultimately better, uh, better impact and social outcomes for the communities that uh, we're supporting. So the Compass project, was uh, created to be that partnership to bring together our best thinking as folks that are um, in systems design and systems planning. Um, that's our background at, at Help Seeker. And um, we get brought in by different communities to help them solve these social challenges and bring the data tools to, to help them on that journey. Um, but how can we bring uh, some of the best thinking in academia as well? Hence the uh, partnership with, with Mark's team at University of Toronto to, to think differently about the tools that we have and um, the way we structure data to do so. So the uh, funding for this project was um, a result of the digital supercluster, kind of being the lead investor, if you will, along with Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And um, uh, Microsoft uh, kicked in some, some Azure credits and additional funding as well. And uh, Help Seeker was the, the, lead, um, the lead partner to bring this to market. So you're looking at a, one of the results of, of this work, and it's just one. I'm going to give you some more examples of what's possible with, uh, with this type of thinking. But essentially, we uh, are able to um, find, in this example, uh, the various domestic violence shelters across Canada, and we do so by by scraping and parsing unstructured data. So the websites of everything from Facebook sites to um, actual formal sites, Canada Revenue Agency filings, etc., we're able to understand of which of these are serving, for in, in this example, Indigenous um, population specifically. But we can also um, understand which of these qualify as transitional housing versus emergency shelters versus DV shelters as well and how many facilities we have and so this is one specific example that um, is actually a Canada mortgage and uh, CMHC um, output for one of their uh, strategic planning efforts around uh, supporting Indigenous domestic violence um, um, gaps across the community anything in yellow is uh, there those are actually reserves and then um, blue is in, in also, anyway, additional population characteristics. So this idea of putting together public data with data that didn't exist before is the kind of the premise here to highlight in terms of value add uh, that couldn't be done before. But uh, the Compass project is much bigger than that. So I'm sh uh, what we're currently commercializing is this uh, this Cardo Insights platform that I showed you a screenshot of, and that's specifically for these systems planner entities, like municipalities, like um, executive directors of major uh, charities that are um, operating in the space, um, federal government, provincial governments, etc. There's additional components to uh, the platform. Navigi is a platform that uh, connects people to supports, and that's actually been in market for over four years and accumulated about 2 million plus interactions uh, for people that are looking for support. So anything that, that we map, we can also put out to for free for, for people looking for support to connect to this really fragmented social safety net that we have. And there's 250,000 listings that we have on there. It's the biggest one of its kind in, at least in Canada's history. I think the the closest um, example would have been Canada Revenue Agency, which was 80,000, but majority of those are not actually serving people on the ground. They're, they're just charities. So it's a, there's a big difference between what actually serves people and what actually receives funding uh, to do charitable work. So um, pretty, pretty massive undertaking that um, we're able to, to deliver value to people looking for support and it's, it's, it's free. So we're not commercializing that piece. 
Um, so that's where we um, were able to, to take this further. The missing piece in the middle, which is um, the piece that's still uh, waiting to be kind of fully brought to market is kind of the, the linking, right? The linking of the client to the um, to the resources in real time and the service provider. And that's this middle piece called Moretto, uh, where we have the client data management reporting and referral uh, flows. So we have an MVP of that that we produced in this in this process, uh, but we're, we haven't put it into market yet, um, primarily because of the limited resources. We can kind of put one out at a time. Uh, so Cardo has been the, the current focus, but it's, it's there, it's, uh, it's in our roadmap as well. But they all come together right in, into a one platform to connect the dots between the help seekers. So those are the, the people in that are looking for support, uh, the people that are servicing them. So folks that are, would be using um, Moretto uh, component of the platform and Cardo, which is the systems planners, the funders, the policy makers as well. And so those are those are the pieces that that we were able to develop during um, this 18 months um, of really interesting, really deep, deep R&D work. Um, my brain still hurts from it. Um, and none of that stuff would have been possible without the the magic that makes the thing work. Uh, which we call it Valto, the vault. Uh, Mark actually named it, and I kind of iterated on it. Um, but it's the the ontology, so the the way that we're actually able to connect the dots between all of these data sets and actually make meaning out of it. So be being able to tell you that uh, you know this program that's saying it's doing emergency shelters uh, over here is actually the same as um, as an, an emergency shelter that's called uh, crisis center over there. So the ability to make sense between uh, different nomenclatures that might be existing in in the sector, which is like I said, very fragmented. That Rosetta Stone ability to translate is is what makes this whole thing work as a really critical component. Uh, that brings it all together. And that's again, part of this, this innovation um, that's never been done before, which makes it really, really tough to do, but really rewarding as well. So um, I wanted to give you a sense of where things are at now. So Cardo, that's the, the product that we've commercialized. So we can, you can see here supply demand calibration. How do we think about the social safety net when we think about social challenges on the ground? where we see problems, uh, things like homelessness, things like um, folks that are have untreated uh, mental health or untreated substance misuse, uh, overdoses, you know, social disorder challenges on the ground. There's a mismatch essentially between the supply, the offerings of the social safety net, everything from uh, drug treat, uh, treatment to um, supportive housing and the demand, what's happening in terms of the, the factors that are driving um, substance misuse or um, people falling into these situations as well. So the supply demand calibration is the kind of the driving concept between uh, in Cardo. And as you can see here, it's, it's bringing the data together to the decision maker from different sources. And I'll, I'll give you more of an example if, if we have time. It's also giving them their recommendations and their actionable next steps. Like, again, People don't have time to mine 50 different data sets to understand why this is happening at the local level. And they certainly don't have time to do the best practice research and understand exactly what that next actionable step might be. So by kind of bringing this to them in a platform that's uh, cost efficient, competes with uh, big consulting for a much lower price. So um, we do this on a membership basis where it's a $5,000 a year membership with a two Cardo rather than kind of having a one-off project approach. So moving into that lower cost um, and why is it, does it have to be $5,000? Yeah, it has to because majority of our municipalities are really small. They don't have um, $100,000 to spend on one project. They can, they really just need the stuff on demand and they need it to be a really, really low cost as well. So we've, uh, we've had to figure out a way to, to do that for as, as, um, cheap as possible and continuously bring value because social issues are changing all the time as well, right? So um, this July, our topic is on um, online synthetics and how that's impacting 
uh, communities on the ground. I'll give you some examples of, of what Cardo was uh, putting out in July. That's again, last, last month, the topic was um, affordable housing and preparing for the housing accelerator fund, which is a completely different topic, different data sets, but of course, all related as well. Um, and here's Naviji, and this is also a plug if you do have folks that are uh, providing uh, services on the ground and are interested in, in joining this network, it's free and it will continue to be to be free and will continue to improve. We uh, finished a um, update on our kind of our core data set for this and looking to um, upload that into into Naviji in the fall as I as our kind of um, upgraded release, just because we have, like I said, much better data today than we than we did before this project as well. And just to give you a little bit of um, examples here, and I, I mentioned this before, but this is just a um, snapshot of some of the the types of data that that we bring together in the platform why it's important to keep on top of it in a much more nimble way. Just the velocity of, of data is very, very different when you're looking at housing versus uh, business charity data versus scrape data. Obviously, it's, it's all very, very uh, all over the place. Um, and the ability to link data to say something novel because we're able to layer insights um, on top of each other is, is um, critical. So signal versus noise. We've got lots and lots of data coming in at us, but what is the actual thread? What's the story there? Um, so I'm I'm kind of giving you this example around homelessness because I know it's a it's a, a hot topic. And you know how might we read the signals of of what's happening around homelessness on the ground, knowing that we've got these very very different uh, data sets coming in. So. Um, how am I doing for time, Alex, before I, you know? Uh, get... Perhaps, Selena, uh, maybe three, four minutes. Yeah, maybe that's fine. Time. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So I'll uh, give you a little bit of, uh, of the example that we're looking at for in July. And the premise here is that we've got um, signals from the community up that homelessness is growing uh, much faster um, and I'm giving you a, an example in, in Alberta, just because we we're in Alberta and it's much easier to tell a story um, in Alberta um, versus all of Canada in three minutes, but uh, the story is consistent. So smaller communities, homelessness rates is growing much faster than urban, um, bigger urban centers. You can even see here in Calgary, in fact, had a, a, a decrease in their homeless count. Um, and Edmonton's increase from 2016 to 2022 uh, was only 44% compared to Lethbridge, which was 410. But overall, the city's average was 18% as a whole. However, um, we're also uh, getting the signals from um, Government of Canada, Statistics Canada, that hey, we're actually core housing need is is uh, decreasing. We're, you know, we, reading these signals, we might say, and municipalities have said this to us. Well, we're doing much better because our core housing need has decreased and it's it's renter or owner. It has decreased consistently. Um, and so lots of municipalities have misinterpreted this to say, oh, it's because we're, you know, we're doing something really great. No, that's not true. It's yeah, it's you can't really attribute your two additional housing units to have brought down uh, systematically brought down core housing need across the country by this much. But the important thing back to this, it's it's not matching reality. There's uh, you're walking over people on the street overdosing and you're you're saying that core housing is is decreasing. Therefore, homelessness is you know implied that it's things are getting better and, and they're not. Right. So there's something else going on. Uh, when we dig deeper into into data, we see, for instance, that um, the types of change in proportions where people are uh, coming into homelessness from uh, systems, health and corrections, treatment and detox are, are primary, so the major, major source in here. Um, and so we start looking deeper into you know, what is happening in terms of um, the, the broader uh, economic and also uh, informal economic trends. And here's the, the data coming through from the United Nations World Drug Report that was released um, just uh, over just maybe 10 days ago, showing the, the types of supply changes uh, that we see uh, internationally. This is methamphetamine flows globally. 
um, again, showing that North America is one of the key centers. We also see that Canadian border seizures of novel narcotics is growing. You can see this is significant. We knew this was happening um, as well on the ground, but now we have the data to show it. Here's Alberta's uh, volume of new synthetics per capita. So new synthetics are um, something that's coming through in, in the drug supply, leading to those overdoses, but leading to those social disorder uh, challenges as well, because those are the substances that are much harder to detect, much more potent, and um, unfortunately create some of the, um, the social disorder calls in, in urban centers, not just in Alberta, but nationally and internationally as well. And so we can see further that this diversification of um, the supply is also manifest in the accidental deaths. Uh, again, I'm speaking about Alberta's challenges as well. You can see in 2016 versus 2022, there's a connection uh, between the, um, the types of supply that we see in folks that are over uh, dying from accidental overdoses as well. And again, meth versus uh, benzos, just the, the change that we see over and over again, and the connection to uh, the online market as well, and how quickly uh, one can get these drugs into, um, into Canada. It's convenient, it's cheap, and it's booming. So again, the data being able to show the connections of, of this you know, can, can start to tell us what might be happening and where we might intervene. Uh, because uh, the housing continuum that we might have considered in the past is not necessarily the housing continuum that we require to respond to these challenges. And so this concept of integrating continuums is something that uh, this project is able to, to let us do because we can optimize not just our housing response, but also our um, addictions, treatment intervention, mental health supports as well. Um, so that's the, the value add, that's the promise of, of this type of approach to systems planning, and uh, hopefully something that uh, gave you something to, uh, to chew on as well. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much, Alina. I, I believe I have two questions here, one from Chad and one from my colleague, uh, Eduardo. Perhaps I'll turn to Eduardo first, and then we can move to the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. It's a wonderful presentation in very short time. Uh, is that you are at the intersection of uh, social health housing issues in which technology is a kind of a driving factor of integration. Uh, with COVID, we saw the extent of this problem, but also the exacerbation of the problem in terms of uh, mental and social disruption issues. I have two questions to you. The first one is, how do you see Navigi and uh, your response that originally was somehow in the realm of charity, but how it moves to institutionalization, how it can move to another form in which is not only empathy or, or interest, but the real uh, programmatic public responses integrated in something that I will get as a serious public health problem. Uh, that that I, I would like to hear from you. And the second, it's uh, um, connected to the first question. How do you see that uh, uh, other actors that are not only in the health seeker sector, but uh, can be the development in this continuum that you mentioned uh, from homelessness to, to real commercial housing, mm -hmm. which are the the elements that you think will help you to transition from the very first to the last one? Oh, I realized I put, uh, instead of unmuting, I put my camera <laughs> off. Um, thanks for the question. So on the charity institutionalization, charities are institutions. They are 80% funded by, by government. Um, so from a resourcing perspective, majority of, of the charitable sector is, a, is an extension of the state from my perspective. There yeah. are exceptions. I, 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 agree, I agree on the institutionalization. What, what I meant is institutionalization in the sense of scaling up and, uh, and, and bringing it to another level, yes. And not remain as a charity, yes. I see, I see, I see. And you're referring to the technology? Uh, how do we scale up the technology? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest challenge that we have is that it's it's hand to hand combat to get adoption of new technologies, a majority of um, like I said, municipalities don't have a lot of exposure to to these types of solutions and um, lots of them are still on kind of pen and paper and Excel maximum. So there, you know, there's a lot of digital adoption challenges to smaller uh, communities. And then in the bigger cities, like, you know, the Calgary's, the Toronto's, they have entire data teams that would, you know, pale and, you know, they put us to shame, right? They have so much capability, but they're, they are focused on, on city business instead of the integration uh, concept that that we are are focusing on. So, I mean, the only way I would see kind of a large scale adoption is if, if you actually have some a kind of, not necessarily a super national, but something that um, is the, the integrator that has a mandate around integration that is not, you know, a startup that would be kind of advancing something like this. So the, the partnership with CMHC has been great However, CMHC is also limited in what they can push. They have a housing mandate. They don't have a health uh, safety, uh, right? So there's a opportunity if the government of Canada, for instance, would say to advance the SDGs, we need um, entities in the social safety net to have common measures and um, common tracking, common reporting standards, et cetera. And there's lots of us that are in the space that are, are talking about, you know, what that might look like to have a common ontology, common impact frameworks, et cetera. I know I'm not the, the only one. And then you have a thriving marketplace of technology solutions that would be competing for that business, for instance, um, to, you know, give um, customers different options so that we can continue to have a competitive technology market when it comes to, to solving those problems the cheaper, the better. Currently, there's there's so many things that we have to retrofit. And we were just in the middle of a project right now where we are trying to merge data in from a kind of market software vendor that was retrofit to social impact and is just not working. Like we can't even get out of it how many people somebody housed <laughs> so, or what the recidivism in homelessness has been. So I really do think there's a there's a need for purpose built solutions for social impact that are in, integrally different from um, what we might have in the private sector currently. And not that the clearly the private sector can have a super role to play into it, but we just can't take things that work in marketing and put them into you know ending homelessness efficiently. Um, from what I've seen currently. Uh, you had another question too, and I forgot it because I got distracted by my answer. Maybe we have a time constraint, but uh, yeah. quick, uh, you showed this uh, graph with a continuum from homelessness to transition mm -hmm. to, to real commercial housing. How that would operate this continuum moving from one to the other, which are two or three key driver elements that will help you really to achieve that? Mm -hmm. through, you mean through the technology? Yes. Yeah. So in in the Compass platform, we have this this concept of um, the help seeker having a profile that would travel with them um, across these these various interventions. And then you've got your marketplace of of services and accommodation solutions where um, the provider also has a profile. So regardless of of where they are in that exchange, you're you're starting you're seeing the story of the client coming through these various systems, whether it's it's health, um, um, homeless sector, et cetera. So that was that was the concept there to to enable that. We can currently do parts of it, right? So we have service providers that put on on uh, Naviji what they offer, and we have people that are looking for support to say what they need. And so it's the the matching of supply demand. Um, is the the kind of ideal state of, and then that's where you see the mismatch because you can notice right away this service provider or this you know um, for profit uh, provider that's offering things at at a certain uh, bracket is mismatched with the client that you know maybe they can actually afford it but they're. Uh, supportive housing needs are not being met because there's no home care to go along into in, into the the unit with them, 
either. So it's it's not just the homelessness um, end of the spectrum. It's you know it's all the way into assistive housing or and supportive housing. Thank you, um, Alina. I have one more question from the chat here, and thank you so much to Patrick for being such an engaged audience member here. Uh, Patrick is is asking: Is there an intent on providing an evaluation tool that highlights social savings? Um, he has some other ones as kind of follow ups, and that savings that the operating, uh, the public spending could in part be redirected to help funding capital expenditure for for that housing. Uh, so, yeah. please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's great. I we just did something like that for Sunshine Coast. Uh, Sunshine Coast is in uh, coast of of BC uh, island, eight island communities. So their challenge was exactly that: can they show value proposition, or can we model different cost scenarios? Uh, we only have this many millions of dollars. Do we put it into into um, seniors and health supports? Do we put it into families? Do we put it into children? What's the return on investment into that? So, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a really great use case for uh, for how you can use use this data. I I don't think it's super innovative. I mean, we we've been we've been doing that for a for a really long time in the SROI world. What I think might be different here is that you can you can do it faster and and cheaper than than before because you have a a database of of these benchmarks and you have a database of these costs and the the model just again can churn scenarios out on demand versus having to do a big economic study on on something like this. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, SROI is a is a really great use of of uh, this data for sure. Awesome, thank you, Alina. And that's definitely something that the pavilion is interested in uh, in terms of identifying those uh, key impact investment areas as well. Uh, we are about one presentation behind in terms of the schedule. We have two presenta uh, presentations left. I will move on to um, who's sitting with me here in the same room. Um, Professor Mark Fox, Director of Urban Data Center from the School of Cities at the University of Toronto and Distinguished Professor of Urban System Engineering. Mark will present on city data, ontologies, models, and impact standards to achieve SDG 11. Mark, I'm going to mute myself so you can take over here. Thank you. Okay, can you see? You're muted, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. My name is Mark Fox. Uh, I am uh, the director of the Urban Data Center within the School of Cities at the University of Toronto. I'm also a distinguished professor of urban systems engineering within the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover two topics that are related to data and measurement. Uh, one that focuses on cities and how we measure uh, cities uh, related to UN SDGs, and the second is how we measure uh, social purpose organizations and the impact that they have, again, related to UN SDGs. Um, I'm sorry that my slides are not as pretty, beautiful, and full of pictures like everybody else's. The best I could come up with um, was uh, this, which is from the matrix, uh, which shows data and uh, enjoy it while you can. We're gonna go on to less interesting slides. So um, let's talk about my journey uh, to uh, why I got into this whole area of measuring city performance and uh, then subsequently in the area of social purpose organizations, charities, et cetera. Um, the, my journey started in 2012 when I was uh, asked by the Dean of Engineering to go to the, uh, to the, the launch meeting of the Center for Urban Science and Progress at, at New York University, um, uh, University of Toronto, along with a few other universities were members of this whole initiative, and I was part of the team from University of Toronto that um, participated in that launch. Um, 
at that meeting, I actually met a number of university professors who I knew nothing about, never met before, and uh, whose focus was on urban issues. And one of the people I met over dinner was Professor Patricia McCarney, who uh, led a project funded by the World Bank in the province of Ontario uh, to study uh, performance indicators at nine cities. And what you see on the right are the list of cities uh, that they evaluated. Now, um, across all those cities, slides are not changing. Perhaps reshare. Okay. One sec. Share screen. Can you see that? I see city indicators. Okay, great. So what they discovered in their analysis is that there are over 1,100 indicators across the nine pilot cities that cities were using to measure their performance. What they also found, which was amazing, was only two of them were comparable. And so not amazing, that was somewhat shocking. So if you want to compare different cities in terms of how they perform in different areas, such as education, uh, transportation, et cetera, they were in fact incomparable if you looked at the indicators being used. Um, that led uh, to McCarney and others at the Global City uh, uh, Indicator Facility to uh, start the creation of something called ISO 37120, uh, which was published in May of 2014. And it is a global standard uh, for sustainable development, resilience of communities. Um, and it contained 100 indicators uh, that were defined across 17 themes, such as economy, education, environment, finance, health, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what was unique from my perspective about this was not just the identification of these indicators, because there's lots of indicators out there uh, being created by a variety of, of uh, organizations. What was unique from my perspective was that in comparison to other indicator definitions provided by other organizations, Theirs was the most complete in providing a detailed definition of each indicator. So for example, if you look at the primary student teacher ratio within the education theme, uh, you see this definition here. I'm not going to repeat it, but you can read it while I'm talking. The, the, when compared to other indicators for the same topic, such as student teacher ratio, the definitions were simply the number of students divided by the number of teachers. This provides us with a more detailed analysis, which means that it's possible to provide an apple and apples comparison when, when cities are using the same indicator definition from ISO 37120 uh, to measure uh, their particular city in this area. Now, here's an example of the, uh, the city of Toronto's 2013 100 indicators. This is just a small subset of it. Uh, and in particular, uh, if you look down here, you'll see 6.4 uh, primary education student teacher ratio. This, these are the numbers that were reported by the city of Toronto at that particular time. And in particular, it's 14.6 students per teacher. Okay. Now, interesting thing about this is uh, I was having a conversation with um, colleagues in Melbourne, Australia. And we, I said to them that City of Toronto reports that it's 14.6, the, the ratio of students to teachers. Um, and Melbourne said, well, their reported ratio is 24.1. And so the question is, why are they different? And in fact, it was actually a more interesting conversation with them because the people from Melbourne accused me of lying. Um, now, I didn't make up these numbers. Um, I was just reporting what the city of Toronto provided. Uh, and, and I had no way of saying why it was 14.6. Um, and they, but they accused me of lying, um, which I found funny. Um, but what it really says is that when cities report their indicators like this, it boils down to nothing more than a beauty contest. Because if you don't know why it's 14.6 or 24.1, what's the value of the indicator? Are they measuring the same thing? That's the bottom line. And we don't know because it's just a simple number. 
And so that led uh, to us looking at the problem of how can we dig deeper into the data that was used uh, to derive those numbers uh, so that we can do some type of comparison uh, amongst them. But the challenge there is that if you want to be able to compare the numbers, uh, the indicators, the metrics that different cities are using in order to perform transversal or longitudinal analysis, we need more than a global standard for indicator definitions. That's something like UN SDGs and ISO 37120 provide. We need a global standard for how to represent city data that was used to actually derive these indicator values. And so that led to us, and, and sorry, and that, uh, that has to address, so that is the creation of that standard, has to address the issue of semantic interoperability. What's semantic interoperability? It's the ability of computer systems to exchange data with unambiguous shared meaning. So a very simple example here is, if I look at data that's in a water and sewage department database, it may use the term plant. And if I look in a parks and recreation database within a city, they may use the term plant also, but mean entirely different things. And this is just the most simple example I can give you of the issue of inability to exchange data with a shared understanding. So that led to the creation of the pulse gnosis project. Pulse gnosis means city knowledge. Um, and the focus is ultimately to automate the analysis of city indicators, that is automating the analysis of city performance. And to do that, we need to identify the content that needs to be published to support the analysis of, these, of their indicator performance. So before we even get to, to the point of saying, how do we represent that data? We need to understand what data needs to be represented for an education. Uh, indicator or a water and sanitation or transportation or public health, et cetera. Secondly, we need to provide standards for publishing uh, that, that data. Uh, and third, we need to provide tools to automate the analysis uh, of those indicators of that data, uh, either to support longitudinal transversal analyses, longitudinal being how a city's measurements change over time and transversal as to how to, to compare cities to different cities. Um, and ultimately, we want to be able to determine the root cause of the differences. And to do that, and I'm not going to go into detail with this picture, we need to be able to represent the definition of indicators. We need to represent uh, theme-related knowledge, that is knowledge about um, the education system, what the grades are, uh, what's primary school, what's secondary school, et cetera. And please note that this is different on a city by city basis. Uh, and hence we need to know what uh, city specific definitions are of primary, secondary, and we need to be able to represent the actual data that they use to derive their the indicators. So if we can create a way or what we refer to as ontologies of representing these four different types of information, then we can input that into an AI based uh, uh, analysis engine that could do the deep dive that can figure out uh, the root cause of why uh, cities change over time or why they're different from one city uh, to another. This project led to the creation of, of a variety of city data standards or what we refer to ontologies um, within the areas of solid waste, safety, finance, energy, telecom, water and sanitation, recreation, fire and emergency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, shelter transportation, uh, and more basic uh, standards for representing activity-based costing, quality, resources, activities, time, organization structure, and behavior, skills, and policies, et cetera. And it allowed us, once we created that, to create an AI-based agent that drills down into the supporting data to compare how definitions may have changed. So for example, if we look at Toronto in 1990, 1990 and the, definite, the, the student teacher ratio and compare it to 2010, if we just look at the number of students and number of teachers in 1990 versus 2010, all the numbers tell us is that something has gone up or down or stayed the same. 
but it doesn't give us any insight into why it changed. But with the use of these ontologies, we can drill down even, even further and ask the question, did the definition of student change between 1990 and 2010? In 1990, did we only include um, uh, regular students? And in, nine, in 2010, were special needs students included in the definition within the school systems? If that's the case, that brings in a lot of other types of teachers uh, that are uh, for, provided to support uh, special needs. Um, on the other hand, if you are familiar with Toronto, between 1990 and 2010, the outer cities of Toronto were amalgamated uh, with the city, and hence you have their student teacher ratios combined with the city of Toronto's ratios, which also could be the, case, the basis for what that change is. And so by having a richer representation of the underlying data that's used to support the derivation of these indicators, we can actually get down to what the root causes are and not provide a very shallow, simplistic view of uh, the number of students went up or down. The impact of this work uh, is number one, uh, the creation of a global standard called ISO IEC 21972, which is an ontology for smart city indicators. Uh, this ontology allows us to take indicators such as average number of skills each job seeker has gained if we're dealing with the uh, social services world. Um, and translate that into a data representation, which allows us to deconstruct this into its constituents, such as average number of skills each job seeker uh, post the intervention of an organization, let's say the city, an average number that's uh, and subtracted from it, the average number of skills each job seeker pre-intervention. And it goes into more detail as to who the job seekers are, how are they defined, uh, et cetera, what the skills are that they, they've acquired. And so this uh, standard 21972 for the representation of the definition of city, city indicators was published in 2020 and is the basis of other work that we have been doing. Uh, the other work that we have been doing continuing our work on cities in general is the development of another standard called 5087. Uh, 5087 is just beginning to emerge from the ISO IC uh, standards community. Uh, it is a stratified uh, set of standards of which there are standards for representing uh, basic concepts such as time, location, activity, et cetera. There are standards to represent city concepts uh, such as household services residents, and there are standards for representing uh, service-specific concepts, uh, such as vehicles and transportation network, if we're talking about transportation. Um, the, one of the uh, service level standards we're working on right now is for transportation planning, 5087-3. Uh, we have just had uh, approved the our work on the creation of a standard for public health emergencies, and there will be other standards that will be created over time in housing, water and sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the impact of this, as an example, is that we've been working with the City of Toronto uh, on applying 5087 to create a common data model uh, for the exchange of information across city, the city's various departments and external stakeholders. Uh, what you're seeing here is just a stratified uh, portion of the common data model to the Toronto City Common Data Model, where the black is core and shared across all the different departments, and the blue is specific to a particular area. Uh, in this case, it's 311. I'm not going to go into detail about that. That is currently <clears throat> this common data model uh, for the city of Toronto is currently under review and socialization within the city, uh, and who knows when it's going to pop out as the uh, as a uh, actual standard within the city, uh, given the time it takes to move things through. Um, another benefit uh, of uh, 5087, another set of benefits it enables the sharing of data amongst city division services with external stakeholders, enables the integration of third-party software with the cities. It simplifies the procurement process because when the city has a standard with which city data is to be represented and communicate, then uh, urban tech providers can uh, adopt that standard and that then simplifies the procurement process. 
It provides a conceptual data model for the existing city information systems and a direction for, there to, for them to transform their data models for their information systems. And it provides a data model for civil, city digital twins. Now, let me turn uh, my uh, focus now to impact measurement. Uh, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the whole area of impact measurement, it's focused on the intended and unintended changes that occur across organizations or with their stakeholders over a period of time as a result of an organization's activity. Um, within the impact measurement community, uh, there are often identified five uh, dimensions of impact, such as uh, what the outcome has occurred in the period, whether the outcome is positive or negative, and how important it is, who experienced the outcome, and how underserved are the affected stakeholders, how much change has occurred, scale, number of people, depth, uh, duration, contribution uh, with a change if likely happened anyways, and risks associated with the change if it does not occur. Uh, within, our, within our work, we have added a sixth dimension, which is how does the organization deliver its impact, which focuses on representing the activities and outputs of an organization. The result of um, this project, and this project that I'm referring to, uh, is the development of the Common Impact Data Standard as part of the Common Approach uh, project, which you can find at commonapproach.org and led by uh, Kate Ruff at Carleton University, uh, is a creation, oops, is a creation of the Common Impact Data Standard, which provides an explicit representation of organizations, their impact models composed of programs. Each program provides services. So program could be relieved, reduce poverty. Uh, services could be uh, providing food banks, uh, training, et cetera. Uh, all these services are meant to have some type of outcome that are focused on uh, various stakeholders. Uh, and then there are associated in indicators for measuring outcomes, uh, et cetera. The benefits of the Common Impact Data Standard uh, is that it provides a structure of how to think about modeling and measuring impact. Uh, it makes explicit both the expected outcomes, risks, how they're achieved and measured, et cetera. And we are actually applying this outside of the social purpose organizations we're dealing with. Uh, we're applying it to placemaking, uh, where the capture of explicit outcomes, risk benefits, et cetera, stakeholders is often uh, unsaid. Uh, it provides precise definitions of the terminology, thereby reducing ambiguity and and ambiguity of interpretation. Uh, it fosters interoperability across various uh, SPOs, social purpose organizations. Uh, it makes it possible for benchmarking uh, social purpose organization performance, therefore making it possible to identify best practices. Uh, it makes it possible for grant makers to aggregate data uh, when they, uh, if they um, uh, adopt the common impact data standard. Uh, and it makes the components of impact machine interpretable interpretable so that open source software and other technologies uh, can be applied to analyze and interpret the data. What is the impact of the common impact data standard to date? Uh, as Lena in the previous presentation mentioned, it was adopted within the Help Seekers Digital Supercluster Compass project. So the core of uh, the, the Compass ontology is the uh, common impact data standard. Uh, but it has been um, extended in a number of directions uh, about organizations and what their uh, what needs they satisfy and stakeholders and the needs that they have. Uh, there are various organizations now aligning with the Common Impact Data Standard, Microsoft, Salesforce, and a number of social service sector software vendors are now aligning uh, so that they can output Common Impact Data Standard. Uh, uh, impact models and impact reporting using the common impact data standard output it and input it. And uh, it has been incorporated in the ISO IEC 5087-2 uh, standard and most recently announced uh, last month, Employment and Social Development Canada uh, will require over 800 agencies to report their impact uh, using the common impact 
data standard, which I think is a major coup for uh, this work. So I will end my presentation there. And if there are any questions, I am happy to uh, answer them. Thank you so much, Mark. I think everybody can hear me from your computer, I hope. Um, perhaps what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn over to Eduardo again. Mark, you have your sound? Yes, now I do. Fantastic. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, honestly, a wonderful presentation. I I think uh, here we are in, in a very interesting uh, best practice for the world, which is data technology standards and solutions for cities to implement better policies. I have two questions. Uh, more or less, I think uh, I, I have a general idea of the possible response, but uh, I think for the public and for myself, for other cities will be interesting. <clears throat> In this model that you presented, uh, what is the possibility to integrate some form of uh, in the standards they call metaphysical aspects, or I would say social, politics, ideology, social structures, culture, human relations, as part of the ontology mechanism to, for decision making, and, and uh, how standards would apply there. And the second question that we have seen uh, in, in some of these ISOs is the possibility of some um, biased data impact in the sense of uh, cities with more data and more capacities will lead, which is not your fault, of course, but how you will drop that to inequitable outcomes and eventually to reinforce social disparities. In other words, how smart cities can contribute to more inclusive environments at, at the end. Those are going to be my question to you. Uh, Eduardo, you're not asking simple questions. Uh, the, to answer the, the, the first question, the, the, the integration of information of social, cultural, uh, political dimensions is a challenge. Okay, and what I mean by a challenge is there has been work on the creation of ontologies for representing various aspects of that. Um, when we create these ontologies for cities and impact measurement, we start by identifying the use cases for the use of the data and then identifying what types of questions we want to be able to answer. And so in order to choose which ontologies or portions of ontologies we wish to include from a social, cultural, political perspective, we need to start off with uh, understanding the types of questions we want to be able to uh, answer using it. Uh, so it's easy to talk in general about we should have that type of information available. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly what the nature of that data is that we want to include and how we want to include it. And so. Um, so there is a process by which we have to follow to understand that. But again, I want to say there are a number of groups around the world who focus on the representation of that. We focus on the representation of that in the small, what I mean in a small way, uh, with respect to the common impact data standard, in that we provide explicit representation of all the stakeholders. The very first step is do we understand all the characteristics of the different stakeholders that we're trying to provide services for? And if we don't understand that, then we will suffer from the issues of inequality uh, that you raised. So for us, it's very much starting with who are our stakeholders? What are their characteristics? What are their unique needs? Um, and then looking at the service providers, what are the types of needs that they satisfy um, uh, with the various uh, services and goods that they provide? Without doing that detailed representation, it becomes impossible to actually address the inequality uh, uh, problem. And I think as Alina was talking about uh, with the services and products that they do, that you can't make any type of, you can't do any type of decision-making unless you have a better understanding 
of the underlying data uh, uh, and completeness in the underlying data than what currently exists. Um, so that's, that's a short uh, answer uh, to your question. Um, and I forgot the second question, sorry. No, the second question was, to some extent you already addressed, it's uh, this uh, impact of biased data. Yeah. Uh, can, yeah. can lead to inequitable outcomes. Uh, yeah, the, it, yeah, and yeah, it, and again, it 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 um, begins with understanding who your stakeholders are, what their characteristics are, and whether the services or other things that you're providing are addressing the people who actually need it uh, versus the people that you thought needed it, and and that raises a whole issue. Um, um, I remember uh, proposing a. a a project that wasn't funded uh, to create a platform that gathers all this information uh, about what the needs are of people uh, and how they're being satisfied. So we have a better map across the country of that. Luckily, even though we weren't funded, uh, Help Seekers uh, Compass Project was funded, which is the first uh, couple of steps in that direction. So without understanding truly what the needs are across the country, uh, who is in need uh, and what are we actually providing, uh, we can't even begin to address this issue of, in, of inequity of, of how we're dealing with people. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for your response. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. Perhaps I'll switch over to um, my computer. Yes, if you can yep. mute and turn the volume down as well. Okay. So. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Eduardo, for that discussion. We have one presentation left. Apologies, we're a bit over time. I ask that you do uh, stick with us if you are able. Uh, I'll ask uh, Nema uh, Blonder, architect and urban planner uh, with Smart Density, um, to present uh, scaling down uh, transit oriented uh, design at human scale and human speed. I believe that's uh, the acronym uh, is correct. Uh, Nema, the, the floor is yours. Oh, you know what, Neymar? I need to give you permissions. Here we go. My fault. Now you should be able to unmute. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Alex for, and Eduardo, for having me and for this uh, recognition. Uh, I believe that my project is probably the most low-tech <laughs> project uh, among all the presentations, but that's really important because uh, we're still, you know, we have such a long catch-up to do, even in the old traditional, um, the old and traditional design methods. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. Let me share my PDF. So yes, our presentation or uh, urban design approach is called scaling down. Uh, and I will just say, just to start in a positive note that we actually received two awards. Uh, this one, of course, and thank you very much for it again. And the Ontario Association of Architects uh, Shift Award for Public Health and Wellbeing. Because you see, we, and I just came back from an, almost a month in Europe, and, you know, we took the train everywhere, and you took the subway, and you take the, the tram, uh, and you realize how big the catch up that we need to do when it comes to transit and our investment in transit, and these are just three random GO stations that uh, are currently uh, functioning as, as GO stations and look at them. So it's very clear that it, they are about to have a really massive transformation. And now is the time for us to take a moment and review the way we design transit oriented communities. Um, because we invest in transit and it's it's a good thing, it's an amazing thing, and the GO expansion uh, project is uh, is currently uh, undertaking. You don't hear uh, very much about it in the news, but it's happening. Uh, it's the project that is electrifying the lines of the GO trains uh, and the railways, and it's also uh, making the lines every... so all day, both ways, every 15 minutes. So I don't know how many of you know, because every time that I mention it, people are really surprised. But right now you cannot just hop, 
hop on a, tr on a go train and go to Vaughan, for example. The only functioning line that is all day both ways is the Lakeshore line, east and west from Toronto. But we have uh, five lines and all the rest of them have single tracks. So you can't, you really cannot just take a train to Vaughan in the middle of the day. Um, so you, you probably can imagine now how the GO expansion project has the potential to really reshape our region and making everything much more connected and much more compact. But then we step out of this. Uh, this is specifically the Vaughan Metropolitan Center and right when you get out of the subway station and you see this. And you know what? It's, it's an award winning. It's pretty well designed in terms of the quality of the landscape and and but then you just look around you and everything is so oversized you have this massive plaza of emptiness you have nothing you have these tall buildings somewhere in the horizon nothing between them and and I have a few a few examples and we all say you know we each and every of these transit oriented communities will have the slogan of people first. We're putting people first. We are pedestrian friendly. It's walkable communities. But how is this a walkable environment? If I need in order to get to this station cross, I don't know, five, six lane street. And this is not even the most, the widest one. Everything is just too big. Everything is oversized. This is Lakeshore look how many laneways, look at the space that it takes. This is again in Vaughan because we have this assumption that if we have a tall building, it needs to sit on this massive podium and this massive podium needs to be on a really wide street because tall buildings, what they need are just, they have to be on wide streets. And I'm asking, are we really putting people first or it's actually cars? Um, so we said here at the, the office, and this is a specific project that we're working on with Brookfield uh, properties, and we said that we need to scale down. We need to scale down specifically three uh, components in our environment, the streets, the buildings, and the open space. This is a rendering of how we envision uh, this part of the neighborhood, and let me take you through what you see here. So again, we developed this concept because we had this amazing opportunity of working uh, on a new neighborhood near a future GO station um, that is currently still in the making. But here we proposed why not having two thirds of the streets here either car light or completely car free, uh, which is definitely something that we had to do uh, a little bit of convincing with the clients because I, I have to give them a lot of credit, but you, you understand the challenge of coming to the municipality and saying, hey, let's rewrite your standards for streets. Um, so uh, the, the streets, basically what we said is we can really narrow the width of the street. We can narrow or scale down the street wall, right? Like how tall is the, the building that you see when you as a pedestrian experience, uh, when you as a pedestrian gets to experience the street. And we basically said, because yes, this is not downtown Toronto, uh, we can lower the street wall to achieve this really human scale uh, street wall and we'll have towers that are less dominant uh, to absorb the required density because we still had to achieve certain uh, level of density. And lastly is the open space because what we hear from our clients a lot is that um, many of the times there is this one major open space that you deliver at the end of the uh, at the end of the master plan or where you know all phases are completed. What we suggested is a really small plazas, parquets, just a series of open, small open, smaller open space to accommodate uh, that. So this is exactly what you see here. You can see different open spaces, just smaller than a one massive uh, park. Um, a, a lot of low rise to create this human scale experience and towers when needed. Uh, these are the street sections that I mentioned. That two thirds of this neighborhood is either Car, completely car free or car light. 
And I just wanted to make a comparison because uh, of like, let's call it the cookie cutter, uh, master plan near uh, other transitory developments and our scaling down approach because we are achieving greater coverage with this system. That's it. Uh, thank you for waiting for my, you know, joining me for the last presentation. Um, that's it, Alex. Thank you so much, uh, Nema, for that uh, presentation there. Uh, just a couple of, of questions here before we kind of close our meeting here. Uh, you know, we live in such car oriented communities, um, and, and you had briefly spoken to it about the, you know, the clients buying into this, this new model that you're sharing. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, what, what were kind of the tools and um, methods you use to create this interest in the clients? Were you able to show perhaps some of that social or environmental value that would come from something like this? Um, you know, and in addition to that, as we live in this housing crisis and we talk about, uh, you know, the importance of density uh, as well, um, what has been the impact of kind of the scaling down in, in terms of, of density or, or has that just been spread out um, through, through the buildings? Yeah, thank you. So uh, we definitely had to come up with a, a parking strategy for a few reasons. One, uh, each of the units, you still have uh, at least uh, one parking or at least you can access parking. Um, and because of the proximity to the lake, we uh, couldn't assume that we underground parking. It's also very expensive that that will be our model. So we came up with a parking strategy for each of the blocks. And it's something that we had to prove to the client that we can solve. Beyond that, we need to remember that when we plan for these, this is, this is a master plan that will easily be completed in 25 years, if not longer. Uh, we should not assume that our dependency on cars in three decades from today will be the same as uh, as it is today. And we need to have, you know, be, be visionaries when when we talk about uh, parking and parking ratio and the, how dominant the car will be. In terms of density, uh, as, as I just showed that comparison, uh, we definitely, we are not falling short on the density. Uh, it's just that we said, let's have low but dense uh, buildings. Uh, and the, we have towers, we have, uh, the, even the low rise is pretty dense. We're definitely achieving great numbers, but also because we give less roads to, less land to roads and cars, we are giving it to people and that is one of the one of the activities is housing and residential awesome thanks uh Nema. and i i believe i have one question also from my colleague uh, eduardo please go ahead thank you thank you uh, Nama. let me tell you that uh, when you started saying uh, my submission our project is not our technology we are as happy as uh, the other <laughs> technology we believe in in, in social in institutional in space related like yours innovation so we as we value mark and the other presentation for us yours is a, as important as the others I, uh, I can see in your pictures that uh, moving from uh, tod to toc uh, the space is yet not conducive to that in terms of design in other words, we can move from the concept, but not from the design in which mm -hmm. we can see these big avenues and things. And I think your proposal at the very end is the redesign of new spaces of proximity, of density, even new maps in the city and, and, and all the pedagogy of space making and use. Uh, and we, we celebrate and we fully support that. But I have a question to you. If you face the imperatives of cost and benefits, would you be able in the long run to prove that these decisions are in terms of economic benefits, rents, et cetera, <clears throat> paying off as the other solutions in terms of not only social, which are obvious, but uh, some form of real estate economic impact? 100%. So, and you know what, this is the presentation I gave you now was really the high level. I There was no reason for me to get you into all the nitty gritty details. But I can tell you that we came up, for example, you see that orange building here, 
we identified some blocks that could perhaps uh, encourage entrepreneurship and for our client to sell these blocks for workshops or, you know, small scale mixed use developments that could be developed by individuals, for example. So you see, when you when you design a, a a new neighborhood at this scale, the power that you have to really create, have impact, economic impact, sustainability, uh, environmental impact, social impact are, are really great. And it comes, you know, <laughs> a great responsibility, right? Um, in terms of the other benefits, you know, low rise construction is cheaper and more affordable and faster than uh, just, you know, mid rise buildings that are, come with other challenges that I that I covered. Um, so we definitely had a lot of thought and as we develop it, it's a long term, you know, project, but absolutely we come up with that how this new neighborhood can infuse fresh blood, fresh energy to to these areas that are currently a blank slate. And this is the fact that it's a blank slate is part of the of the reason that we have such an opportunity. Thank you, Nima. Uh, Nima, there's one more question from Patrick in the chat box there. Uh, does smart density incorporate community oriented venues uh, to their planning? So this is very early stages. Uh, this project is not completely public yet. It's really nice that you received two awards before it is, you know, we can come with uh, awards to the municipality. There's definitely plans to, there are definitely plans to involve and, uh, and receive community input because of course, as I said, this is blank slate. It's really great opportunity that, you know, uh, we have the, right now for the community communities to to get involved but the opportunity is really really unique in that sense awesome thank you Nema uh, and thank you everybody for staying uh, we are 15 minutes over time here so perhaps uh, I'll just close the meeting um, instead of doing some closing remarks I do appreciate everyone's time uh, just so everybody knows we will have this um, uh, video uh, available online on our website on the virtual pavilion, um, as well as the presentations, uh, if it's possible to share. Um, I'll, I'll speak with each of the speakers later on. Um, but I do appreciate everyone joining us for this third session of Made in Canada Urban Innovations and Transformations. Uh, and just so everyone knows, we will have one more on July 11th, Tuesday, uh, same time. Uh, so please do join us if you're available uh, as well. Again, thank you so much, everybody and have a great rest of the day.